when the Lord saved me. All heaven came down. I was happy and free. Glory filled my soul. For I knew the Lord had made me whole. I should never forget the day when the Lord saved me. Now a life of peacefulness Deep within my heart of mine Since the day that Jesus Took my sins away And to heaven I will go To spend the endless ages While the ever roll Praising his name for the glorious day That he saved my soul I remember the day when the Lord saved me All heaven came down I was happy and free Glory filled my soul For I knew the Lord had made me whole I shall never forget the day When the Lord saved me I remember the day When the Lord saved me all heaven came down, I was happy and free, glory filled my soul, for I knew the Lord had made me whole, I shall never forget the day when the Lord saved me. I messed around. I don't have my wireless mic on. I'll just have to stay near this one so the tape will pick me up. I won't, I won't be able to run around tonight. What's, oh, Shannon, leave me alone about that. All right. <laughs> Evidently, I forgot to turn it off this morning. Everybody downstairs is hearing every word I said to all of y'all at the back door. But to my knowledge, I didn't say anything bad. It was all appropriate. So I was just standing at the back door saying goodbye, but I didn't know my mic was still on. Um, wasn't like me and Rachel got in a fuss, and y'all heard that. We, we have got in fusses before, but y'all didn't hear it, so it's okay. All right, but anyway, anyway, I'll just have to stay sort of halfway close to here, though, because I forgot to put it on. All right, Mark chapter 6 tonight, Mark chapter 6. This little passage got my attention this week. I've never preached on it. have no notes, no markings where I've ever preached it. So y'all have something new tonight, and that's a rarity, I know. I've repeated every scripture many times, it seems like, after so many years. But we're going to title this, Don't Quench, Quench His Mighty Work. Let's read here, chapter 6. And he went out from hence... And came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in their synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that every such mighty works were wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the son of James, Joseph, Judah, Simeon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. And I'll stop reading right there. Brother Jim, I just got to have that wireless mic. The file cabinet in the office, the top drawer, you'll see the black box with the cord wrapped around it. Bring, bring it to me. I just I can't plaster my feet in concrete here and stay. I'm going to move around, and then on the, the CD, you won't hear a thing. And while he does that, Brother Andrew, would you come up here and have a prayer to So 
God, thank you for this Sunday night. And just please let's get a real good sermon and get some real good meaning out of it. And for us to just hold on to it all week and not forget about you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to have a technical interruption. I'm trying to set up the video camera, the CD player. I'm my own technician. And then somewhere in the middle of that, I, I preached the sermon, but I just forgot to put this thing on. Y'all bear with me just a second. We'll tuck this baby in and we'll be, we'll be good, then I can move. We're good, okay? Let me tuck this one notch here just to get so it don't fly around. All right. Let's reroute, if you will, verse 6, because that's our, excuse me, verse 5, that's our main text. And it said, and he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. So he couldn't do any mighty works. And sometimes little phrases in the Bible get a hold of your attention. You think about them, then you reread them. You think about them a little bit more. It kind of sells in your mind. And the, I'm very troubled that in Jesus' own town of Nazareth where he grew up, you would think here of all people he had done mighty works. You'd think. Now this would be the place. Now maybe down there at Jerusalem they're going to think he's an old carpenter hick, you know, from up in Nazareth. They might not listen to him there. Maybe over in Jericho, maybe in Samaria, they'll say, he's a Jewish man, we're Samaritans, we don't want to hear him. But that wasn't the case. They heard him often, not always, but at Jerusalem. They heard him when he went to Samaria, and all those people believed from the latest testimony. He went down to Jericho, and blind Bartimaeus believed him, called upon him, and, and uh, had, had his sight restored. So other places he went and heard, but in his own town, they said nobody listened to him. They quenched his mighty work. And I was just thinking about it and think how often do we not today quench his mighty work? Quenching is when you just kind of, you're not letting something flow. It's kind of like a worst thing in the world. I don't know how, if y'all have this thing like I do, but you use a water hose and you roll it up. And then you try to unroll and use it again. It, un invariably, it's going to have kinks in it. And you say, but I didn't kink it when I rolled it up. How'd it get so kinked up? I don't know how it happens, but it's going to have kink. And if it's a long hose, if it's, say, a 100-footer, and you're down on the far end, you think, why ain't it getting no water? And you wiggle the thing, and then you go to tracing it back. You go to walking it, and there'll be a kink. You get that kink out, then you go back down to the end of it, and you say, I'm still not getting any water. Well, you walk a little farther, there's another kink. You say, how can I unroll this hose without kinking it up so bad? But I, what I'm trying to tell you is when there's a kink in it, you're not going to get water flow. That's all there is to it. It's got to be open 100%. And I have to think today, in our churches today, are, do we have kinks? <laughs> are we quenching the Spirit? Are we quenching His mighty works? Are, we, th are they things kinked where He can't do anything? I think so. And I looked at this text tonight, and I just got to ask myself, and I asked God, and sometimes you read, and I appreciate commentaries with all my heart, and I appreciate footnotes in the study Bible with all my heart, because there's a lot wiser men than me that study the Bible. But sometimes you just got to pray on something and ask God to give you thoughts about it. And I asked myself, why in his hometown was his mighty work quenched? And is that anything we could say related to us today, you know? There's not a church outside that we could blame it on COVID-19, but there's not a church in Gwinnett ever. As many subdivisions, as many people as we got in Gwinnett County, every church I'll be running over. I mean, they just ought to be packed and running over. And as many problems as we have in this world, when people need the Lord more than they've ever needed the Lord, we really ought to pack them out. And when we give an altar call, if we took all in the world and in our life serious, we ought to pack the altars every time. But we don't do it. And our communities don't do it because we quench His mighty word. God's hands not shorten, as it says in the book of Isaiah. His ears not deaf, that He can't save. But our sins have separated between us and God. Our sins have quenched His mighty work so that He cannot work as they did here. Let's talk about this just a little bit. Why did these people quench His mighty works? Could anything relate to us today? Let me say, first of all, I believe they quenched his mighty work in his own hometown because they didn't because of doubt. They just didn't believe this was Jesus the Messiah. They didn't believe it. 
And it says, he comes right down here, and it says they begin to name his family. Is not this the carpenter? Is not this the son of Mary? Is not this the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simeon? Do we not also know his sisters? And if anybody, if I, I used for a long time, I mean, not, not recent, when I first started reading the Bible, I thought Jesus was the only son Mary had. And then I read this verse. That name's four of the boys. And it says sisters. That's plural. So at least two, maybe more. So he had at least six siblings. Maybe he had more than that. So he came up from a big family. But, and they, they doubted because they said, there's no way this man is the Messiah because the Messiah would just come out of the clouds or something. And, but we know this man. We saw this man grow up. We saw him working in the wood shop with his daddy. And we know all of his brothers. They in and out of town all the time. So there's no way this man is the son of God or the Messiah. There, and, and we know they're a poor family. We know they're an uneducated family. So there's no way this man even deserves to be called a rabbi because he's had no training. So we're not going to hear him. In other words, they doubted who he was. Let me say today, folks, let me say people doubt the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you all believe that? People want to believe in a higher power, and that's a good start. But the higher power is no good unless you come to him through his son, God the Son, the Messiah, the Savior. He's the one that brings us to God. And just believing in a higher power and calling it this religion or that religion and, or through this prophet or that prophet or this, this one that dug up these books over here and we're going to follow it. And somebody would say, well, just as long as you're sincere, we're all the same. It really doesn't matter. No, it does matter. These people in Nazareth, they had plenty of religion. Jesus went in their synagogue. They had synagogue every Sunday. But they didn't have the Savior. Why? Because they doubted the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, his deity, his perfection, who he was, his teaching. They doubted him. And there's no thing other that can be said today than that. Sometimes, Brother Bill, in your Sunday school classes, I'm not sure where you get it, but you read statistics. And, you, and some of y'all in Bill's class know what I'm going to say. But the statistics that you come up with are just frightening. It's statistics where surveys have been taken, not, not in some weird cult church out here, but in Southern Baptist churches. And, and some of the statistics are like, do you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? And I can't exactly quote the, 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 the percentages, Brother Bill. Maybe you remember that. But it's, it's like in Southern Baptist churches, it'll be something like 50% or 55% don't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. And then young people will be told, do you believe the Bible is without error? And in Southern Baptist fundamental churches, that you know, oh, twenty percent believe us without error. What about the other eighty percent? They they doubt it. What am I trying to tell you? You want to know why the Lord Jesus Christ, why His mighty work in America is quenched? Because people, not people way off in some weird couple, people right in the house of God that's supposed to be fundamental Bible-believing churches have started doubting who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And that's what these people was problem with. They wanted to keep him on. They, they were glad to say, we got a neighbor up here, Joseph. He's got a son named Jesus. He sure is a good carpenter. Boy, he made a wood table the other day. I wish you'd have seen it. It was good woodwork. And that was fine. They didn't have no problem with that. And he has the nicest family. They are, boy, they're talking about some good brothers. Now, they're good boys. And they, why, why, they're always at the synagogue. And that's fine. They didn't have any problem saying Jesus was a good man, that he come from a good family. But when it flat out come down to saying he is the infallible, perfect God the Son come to earth to save us from our sins, they doubted that. And people today, more and more, yes, even in America, doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. And don't you think they don't? Don't you think for a minute they don't, folks? I'm going to tell you, you want to know why America's in the mess we're in today? I mean, we're in a mess. We need to we need answer prayer on this election. I mean, we do. And, and I don't, it's not my business to stand up here and tell you who to vote for. You go to that, you go to that ballot box and you pull those 10,000 flyers out of your mailbox that I deliver to you, okay, and you read them all. And you just lay them out and let's lay your Bible on top of them and you pray about it. And the Lord will show you what to do. You don't need your pastor to tell you. The Lord's going to show you in your heart what to do. And you pray God to put the, the men, the women, the leaders in their offices that would fear God because they're coins saying, God, we trust. But I'm telling you, in God, America doubts.
Do y'all believe that? If I tell them the truth or not, folks, I'm telling you. He couldn't do mighty works. Why don't people get saved like they used to? Why don't great revivals break out like they used to in centuries past? Because back then they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and who he was. And we just about like these people in Nashville today. We say he was a good man. He said some good things. But the Messiah, the Son of God, a man that lived above sin, no way. There's even a movie made here. It's been about 15 years ago that had uh, the movie was awfully controversial. And I, I saw just a clip or two on TV when it was on, but I have not seen the movie. Don't want to see the movie. But it was showing how Jesus, I believe, was married to Mary Magdalene or something other like that. And they, they found his descendants, these people that was the great descendants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is blasphemy. Yeah. That is sacrilegious. That's trash out of hell. You don't drag the name of Christ. You don't take Christ down to regular man. Yes, he was a carpenter, but he was without sin and above. And he didn't come to earth to, to, to make a family. He come to earth to save our families. Y'all know what I'm talking about today? I'm trying to tell you today, these people quenched his work because they doubted who he was. The Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, Messiah, promised all the way from Genesis, the only one in, that ever was or will be to save us from our sins and get us to heaven. Let's go a little bit farther tonight. Why might these people have, have quenched the Spirit? Let me say too, maybe it was just fear. Fear. They saw him healing people. They heard him teach and they were afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of change. You know, a lot of people quench what God wants to do in their life because of fear. They're afraid because they, 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 they're afraid if he really gets in their heart and they really believe and trust him, he's going to change them. Let me say these Jewish people, they had a good thing going. They had their little system set up and they went to the synagogues and, and they, went to, they went for the festivals down to Jerusalem. They made their little animal sacrifices and the priest and whatnot, they had a pretty good thing. They, they made a good little piece out of money out of it. And the money changers had their temple, had their changers in there and they were exchanging animals and money and selling sacrifices. And I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, when people have, when they have their life and especially their religion all set up, they don't want nobody to rock the boat. You know, they don't want anybody to rock the boat. There's fear. Fear somebody's going to change my beliefs and show me I've been wrong. Fear somebody's going to change my life. You know, these people were afraid because they said, we've taught in this synagogue, but we've never taught like that. We have had sick people in this synagogue. Maybe we said a prayer for them, but we never had one healed like we just saw. They were afraid. They quenched his mighty works and ran him out of town because they doubted and maybe because of fear. Let me say tonight, we can't fear what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do. You know, Lord wants to change people, you know. And people nowadays at best, they'll say a sinner's prayer, but as far as, Lord, get me to heaven, but, 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 but uh, uh, get me to heaven and save me from a sin. To get saved from your sins, you're going to be saved from something. I heard the best I ever heard it said on that subject. Brother Earl Bell said something. I've always remembered it. He said, he said, uh, we was talking about people that say they get saved and never change. And he said, I got a question. What did they get saved from? He said, if you get saved, you got saved from something. You don't go run by right back to it the next day. <laughs> That's what Errol said. And I thought about that. People don't want to change. If you, could, if you could sell places in heaven, you could make a lot of money. Because people don't want to go to hell if they believe in there's a hell. But if you say to get to heaven, the Lord has to change your heart and life. They're afraid of that. Because they got their life and their heart exactly like they want it. And they don't want nobody rocking the boat. I'm telling you. Do y'all believe that tonight? These people, they had their religion. They had their community. They didn't want a new teaching. They didn't want a more powerful, better teacher. A more powerful and better one to pray for their sick. They were afraid of change and afraid of losing their popularity. I'm going to tell you, if you follow the Lord, sometimes you lose popularity. You do. You really do. And I'm going to tell you this too as far as on politics. If a, if, a camp, if a candidate expresses his Christian faith too much, he won't get elected. I've seen that repeatedly. 
I mean, when they really come out and stand for Christ, it people it, it turns people off. I mean, if you if you're gonna stand for Christ, you cannot be afraid of change. You can't be afraid of losing popularity. You gotta say, Christ, here I am, and I know your way, and your and what you say is best, and I'll follow you, and not be afraid of what I'll lose and what I'll you'll lead me into. Amen. I'm trying to tell you tonight, folks, let us not quench the mighty work that Christ wants to do in our lives. Let us not quench the mighty works that Christ wants to do at New Hope Baptist. You look at these people, we could preach on them all you want, but the fact is we're just people just like they were, and the fact is we've all been guilty of quenching the good things that Christ wants to do. We're just like that water hose, and, and, and the water's not coming out. The Spirit's not coming out. And let me say, if, 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 if the water's not coming out, it's got a kink in it somewhere, and it's got a kink, it's the one that unrolled it. It's my fault for unrolling it crooked. I want to say, let me say, if Christ doesn't do the work He wants to do, it's not His fault. He's just as powerful as He ever was. He's just as much the Son of God as He ever was. He's, he loves us, and, and His blood is just as strong as He ever wants to do. But our sins have separated us and our doubt and our fear have quenched his mighty works in our world today. Then let me say one more thing before I hush tonight. Possibly I thought what it was that made these people quench his work was that it was just a matter of pride. You know pride is the thing that says I don't, I don't want to be saved because that's admitting I'm a sinner. And people don't want to admit that. People don't want to admit being a sinner. I've told you before, but I remember when I first got, got saved, one of the first people I ever tried to witness to, I can just remember just as plain as day. And I didn't really understand that and didn't know how to answer him. But I was sitting over there in front of Hawthorne's Grocery in Auburn, and the delivery man, I was riding with him. I was too little to drive, but I was with my daddy's delivery truck, and I was riding. There was an older man sitting on the wood bench right outside of Hawthorne's. And Miss Helen, you remember Hawthorne's Grocery over there, don't you? You remember it well. I don't know who that old gentleman was, but I'm quite sure he's met his maker by now because he must have been 80 then, and I, that was when I was a teenager. So if not, he's 120. We'll say it that way. But anyway, I didn't know hardly how to answer him, but I, I, we got to talking. I said, sir, can I ask you a personal question? Do you go to church? Uh, I have, he said. And I said, well, can I ask you even one more than that? I said, do you know you're going to heaven? And he said, let me tell you, young man. He said, I've never done anything to keep me out of heaven. Said it just almost for pride. I'm not saying that. I'm sure that was a good old fellow. I'm sure people around Auburn loved him, but I don't even know who he was. And I said, we've all done something to keep us out of heaven. We're born all together in sin. And it is a prideful thing to say I've done nothing to keep me out of heaven. It is a prideful thing to say I need a Savior. It was a prideful thing for these people to admit that Christ, this young man that was born and grew up in their community, was not just a kid, but he was the one sent to save them out of sin. The one sent to save them from a devil's hell. I want to tell you, I want to tell you folks, pride will keep you from letting God do his mighty works in your life. You know, we have to constantly... Uh, it, we have to confess our sin. The first John 1 says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't believe that confession is just a one-time thing. I believe we need to confess them every day, you know. We confess them. We own up to them. We own up to how far we fall short. And let me say the Christian life is that about a humbling thing. It's the thing of admitting how far I've fallen short every day and, and admitting that Christ is Lord and I'm just a fallible human being. And let me say these people didn't want to admit that. They didn't. Pride said we are not going to sit and listen to a young boy we watch grow up that when we have a, know a lot more than he does, I'm going to tell you right now, folks, pride will keep a man out of heaven. Pride will keep a man from admitting his fault. Pride will keep a man from reaching out. Let me say this. I won't call a name on this, but somebody just recently that I was talking to dealing with a horrible addiction problem, a horrible addiction problem. And I said to this person, I said, don't you think you need some professional help? Don't you think you need to get in a clinic or somewhere? And this person said, no, I can lick this by myself. I'm sorry, folks, but I don't believe that for nothing. Any man that says, man or woman that says, I can lick this myself, when things get a hold of your life so bad, you've got to have God's help, and you've got to sometimes have a professional's help under, under God's guidance to help you with something. 
you try to lick something yourself. A man that says, I can handle my life on myself. I don't need friends. I don't need a sermon. I don't need a savior. That's a man running to a straight dead end every single time. It's a humbling thing to say, I need another man's help. I need the Lord Jesus Christ's help. He's the Savior. I better follow Him. And I just believe these people in this story quenched His spirit and didn't let Him do the work He wanted to do in His hometown because they were just too full of pride to admit we're sinners, but this man came to save us. We better listen to Him. Oh, I'm telling you tonight, folks, and I'm about to wrap it up. Let's read verse 5 again. He there could do no mighty work, say that He laid a few hands upon the sick folks. He could do no mighty works. I don't think there's no sadder phrase in all the Bible than that. A place Christ could do no mighty works. And it wouldn't have been that as sad of a saying if it was somewhere way off. If Christ would have went over to China and preached and said, Well, they was all they they wouldn't he couldn't do a work over there, they wouldn't believe him. You'd say, Well, you know. Maybe, maybe expect that. If he had went way down into Africa somewhere or another where no one knew nothing about Moses or Abraham or anything, and they didn't believe. But in his own hometown where he grew up, where they had Moses, where they had all the Old Testament prophets, and when he tried to preach from those prophets and show he was fulfillment of it, they wouldn't accept him. They quenched his mighty works, and he had to walk away from that town and didn't do that which needed to be done. All I'm saying tonight, folks, do we quench the work of God in our life? I've just given you some thoughts on how these folks might have quenched it. Maybe we do the same. Yes, I do believe sometimes we quench his mighty works because we doubt. We doubt who he is and we doubt how powerful and great he can be in our life. Let me say, I do believe with all my heart we quench his mighty works because of fear. We fear what he's going to lead us to do. We fear how he's going to want to change your life. And we just got to get sought in our ways and want to stay the same and don't want him to change. Let me say we fear, we, we, we quench his work because we're just full of pride to admit I'm here but I need to be there. That's a humbling thing. But we've got to open our heart and bow our knee to Christ and let him change us. Don't quench his work in your life. Don't quench, let's not quench his work in his church. Brother Mark, we're ready for a song. Somebody needs prayer tonight. The altars are open. You need prayer. What's Christ trying to do in your life tonight, this week? Don't quench it. Don't take that water hose of the Holy Spirit and just kink it up where there's no flow. Let God flow through you. Let God be real. Let Him be powerful. Let's stand there. What you got, Brother Mark? Page 375. Let's stand there, see. Power all power. 
absolute swim Filled with our spirit Till all shall see Christ only always Living in me Any prayer requests or testimony? Any words? I hope these two scriptures have been a blessing and helped you live closer to the Lord today. Amen. And I hope it's been edifying in your life. I truly do. And I appreciate you being here. And uh, just God bless each of you. Have a good week. Come back to Bible study Wednesday. Serve the Lord. Tell somebody about him before then. All right. And after then. Okay. All right. Let us go our separate ways. Appreciate you. Brother Justin, would you have a dismissal?